Well, good morning to you or whatever time it might be for you. It's good to see you, or should I say good to see me. I hope things are going well for you and miss you guys. Excited because tonight uh, the Deacons meet and talking about reopening McCoy when we can once again gather and worship together. Uh, I've been making some plans, thinking about this summer and summer Bible study for 7th through 12th grade, so that's you. Everyone who's uh, watching this through 7th through 12th grade, hopefully we'll be making some announcements about that soon and just really getting excited about the progress of things. So, But this morning, or whatever time it is for you, we're going to continue to be digging into God's Word. This is a Sunday school lesson. You know, in the previous lessons, we have been looking at uh, the beginnings of Jesus' earthly ministry, if you will. And in this lesson, we will continue with that theme. Specifically in this lesson, we are going to examine how Jesus revealed his power throughout his earthly ministry. And as we do so, we will see how the ways in which Jesus taught and performed miracles with authority displayed his identity as the Son of God. That's important. We, we clearly see and understand he was the Messiah, the Chosen One, God's Son, God in the flesh, the one who had the power to proclaim, but even more than that, provide salvation. It is because we have experienced this power of Jesus to save us from sin that we continue his mission of compassionately telling others of his love and salvation. We're going to see Jesus' power and authority. We're going to see Jesus' mission, and we're going to see his passion this morning. And so let's. I, I just want to begin by praying as before we jump in. Lord, I just thank you for this time that we have to open your word, Lord, to be reminded of who you are, the Son of God, the one who provided for salvation. Lord, that you are my substitute, that you died in my place. Lord, may we never forget. Lord, may we be quick to bring honor to your name, to, to proclaim what you have done, to compassionately love those around us. And Lord, that love demonstrated by uh, bringing the gospel. Lord, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. So let's begin by looking at Jesus' power and authority. And I want to start by reading Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. I kind of cut out some of the extra things like the observation stuff like I've done in the beginning. Again, I'm trying to keep these under 30 minutes for you. But uh, please continue to make those observations. Think about, consider, pause the video some of these uh, repeated phrases or words, emotions you might see, something that sticks out to you, an odd detail perhaps. These are important. You, you need to begin to learn to study the word for yourself and to do that daily. Let's read Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught them as one who had authority. I wonder why. Not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was uh, possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Even the demons know and understand who this man was. Do you? Verse 25, be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? And with authority, he even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As we see uh, in this passage, it became quite evident to those around Jesus that his words were not like the typical teaching they were used to hearing in the synagogue. You know, the scribes of the day did not merely, you know, just copy things down, but also helped the people to understand scriptural principles by teaching and interpreting the law. 
They were scholars, yet they did not interpret the scripture using just their own opinions. They quoted and cited others, uh, experts and scholars, rabbis, teachers, kind of like we do today in churches, right? Imagine the people's shock when this man, Jesus of Nazareth, the, the son of a carpenter, walked in and began teaching without quoting anyone else. Jesus was able to teach in such a way because his words came entirely uh, from his own authority. Jesus speaking with such authority revealed who he is, the Son of God, though the people did not recognize it at the time. What makes someone recognizable and believable as an authority on a subject? Think about that. What makes you say, well, I'm going to listen to this person. This person obviously knows what they're talking about. Think about that. What gives them that authority? Not only did Jesus reveal excuse me, not only did Jesus reveal his identity through the authority of his word, but he revealed it through his miracles as well. You know, it began with this teaching, but how did it continue? Immediately after Jesus taught in the synagogue with authority, he displayed or verified the legitimacy of his authority by casting a demon out of a man. People today struggle to believe in the idea of demons. Some prefer to think of demon possession in the Bible as a misunderstood medical condition that we perhaps treat differently today. But this idea does not explain the accounts in the Bible. Demon possession was real. Uh, uh, perhaps is real. I'm thankful I'm a believer. I'm, I, I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And uh, I don't have to worry about demons possessing or controlling me because I am controlled by the Spirit. But demon possession, there, there is a, a war being waged. Ephesians 6 is pretty clear um, between good and evil. And, and in New Testament times, demons clearly had the power to oppress and possess people in an effort to distract from and distort God's work in the world. I, I just want to emphasize again, I, I talked about the reality of this. As believers, we don't have to fear that. Uh, we are protected. We are safe. But Jesus' power, which flows from his deity, uh, the fact that he was God, should compel us to follow him. He, he has authority over our entire lives because of his identity as the Son of God. I mean, he is our creator. John 1 is pretty clear about that. He created us. He has all authority. It's like when my son makes a Lego set. You know, he, he made that Lego set. He has the decision whether he wants to take it apart and rebuild it differently or do whatever he wants with it. And, uh, you know, that doesn't even take into account that he didn't make those Legos. God made everything from nothing. He has complete authority. That's another matter for another day. If our lives are submitted to Jesus as Lord, then we will develop, as enabled by the Holy Spirit, an attitude of humble obedience to the powerful Son of God, who is also our Savior. Not only did He create us and, and therefore have that authority, but He's the one who gave up His life. He purchased our lives with His own life. He saved us. And how does Jesus command to uh, us, how does Jesus command us to live? Well, He tells us to spread the good news about His power and authority over sin and death and evil. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Mark 6. He tells us to go out and, and create uh, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. I don't want to get too distracted. Let me ask a couple questions, kind of get your mind thinking. Don't, don't be afraid to pause it and discuss this maybe with someone else you're watching with. Or, um, What does it mean for you to submit things in your life to Jesus' power? What does that mean? What does that look like? You know, we kind of talk about that. What does it mean for you to submit your life to Jesus? What are some things in your life that are perhaps easy to submit to Jesus? What are some things that maybe are difficult? You know, maybe it's easy to go to Rush or for Wednesday Night Word of Life. It's fun. You know, we have a lot of fun. You know, we're gathering as believers. That's a good way to submit to Jesus Christ. You know, but uh, maybe sharing the gospel, um, go and make disciples, that can take you out of your comfort zone. Maybe that's something that is difficult. 
How about obeying your parents? None of you struggle with obeying your parents, right? You know, I mean, that's an easy one. What does it mean to submit your life to Jesus? How does Jesus identify as the Son of God? How does Jesus, let me, let me start that again. How does Jesus' identity as the Son of God influence the way he lives his life? Is his life different because he is the Son of God? Yeah, it is. And how, how does that, that identity identify Jesus and how he lives his life? Maybe that's a hard question to think about. But how should our identity, let's take it to the next level, how should our identity as adopted sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ change the way that you live? How should your identity as his adopted beloved child change the way that you live? We looked at uh, Jesus' power and authority. Now we're going to look at Jesus' mission. Mark 1, 35 through 38. I just want to make sure this is recording. Okay, good, it is. One time I taught a whole lesson through, and I forgot to hit record. That was a bummer. Jesus' mission, Mark 1, verses 35 through 38. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Have you ever noticed that verse before? Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. <laughs> Everyone in the, everyone's looking for you, Jesus. Have you ever had people make those blanket statements? You know, Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else. Let's not go to them. <laughs> to the near, uh, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Kind of an interesting passage here. We're going to just highlight a few little things. There's a lot going on here in these few short verses. Jesus knew the purpose of his ministry. Bottom line, Jesus understood his mission. But the people around him often misunderstood it. Both the people of Capernaum, you know, these people that he's that were looking for him, everyone's looking for you, and he says, no, let's go somewhere else. All, the, these people in Capernaum misunderstood Jesus, but also his own disciples missed the point of Jesus' words and actions. You know, they got caught up in Jesus' rising fame and miraculous healings and were unable to see Jesus' purpose behind it all. They got so distracted by the amazing things he was doing, they missed why he was doing it. Jesus declared with clarity that he came so that we might know and follow him. He gathered his disciples to move on out of Capernaum, away from the fame and the crowds that sought after only his miracles, in order that he might continue to preach elsewhere. The Son of God came to preach the good news to the world. The Messiah has come to pay the price, the penalty of their sins. Why should Jesus' singular focus of his life and mission influence the way we think about our own lives? Seeing Jesus' uh, focus and determination um, and the way he lived, solely focus on that. Should that affect our own lives? The way we live, the way we think about our lives. What are some things that distract us from our true purpose in life? What are some things that distract us from what God has called you to do? It's easy to misjudge people's intentions. Uh, unfortunately, we probably do that all too often. The disciples did it here, but before we judge them or, or for missing the point, you know, before we are quick to judge the disciples for their misunderstanding Jesus and his purpose, let's pause and consider our own lives. How often does our true purpose of sharing Christ's love through the gospel get lost in our longing for fame or recognition. Though we may long for and, and desire Jesus' miracles, we must always long for Jesus and his real purpose more. His salvation, what he has provided for us, and our role, our job, what he has created us to do to proclaim that to the world around us. Remember that Jesus didn't get caught up in worldly passions and pleasures, uh, in temptations to fame and the idolatry of works, he kept his heart, soul, mind, and strength fixed on the Father and his heavenly purpose. Even as fully God, 
Jesus chose to fulfill his purpose on earth in a manner fully dependent on his Father God. Remember, notice that first verse we read in this section? Uh, regularly, Jesus maintains this focus, maintained this dependence on God by regularly communing with God through prayer, going off on his own for that purpose. Jesus stayed focused on the mission set before him by regularly spending time with his Father. We, we saw Jesus' power and authority. We, we looked at Jesus' mission. Now let's look at Jesus' compassion, and then we're going to bring all three of these together. Jesus' compassion, Mark 1, verses 39 to 42, says this. So he traveled throughout Galilee. You know, he said, come on, let's go somewhere else. We've got to preach this truth. So they traveled throughout Galilee, preaching it in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Lord, I'm suffering. Verse 41. This is a powerful word that's used here. Notice this. Filled with compassion. And the word here is a very strong word. Some translations actually use the word filled with indignation. These are some, this is a powerful word, the compassion that moved Jesus here. Jesus reached out his hand and touched this man, this filthy, unclean, diseased man. Jesus says, I am willing. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus, being fully human and fully divine, allowed his heart to be moved by the suffering of our world. His heart of love for the Father and his creation, his heart and love for his Father and for his creation moved him to action. Jesus carried the concerns of his Father and also experienced them completely as a human. Remember, Jesus is a reflection of God. He's revealing God to us. This is the compassion of our Heavenly Father. Jesus hates evil, and he hates the way that evil has caused destruction in the world. So Jesus reached out and healed the leper who had come to him in faith, a perfectly just and compassionate response. The fact that Jesus was not apathetic or indifferent to this man's suffering is a tremendous source of great hope for us today. Jesus cares about our suffering, about your suffering. This is great news to us because as the Son of God, Jesus is the one who has the power. Jesus is the one with the power to do something about our suffering. Not only is the one with the power, he did do something about our suffering. By defeating death once and for all on the cross, he has freed us from the power of the eternal enslavement to death both here and now, and yet more fully in the age to come. What are some situations in your school or community, perhaps, that, that should move you to act with the compassion of Christ? Why is it important to have both feelings of compassion as well as actions of compassion? You know, it's one thing to look at someone and say, Oh, man, I have great compassion for their sufferings. It's another thing to say, I'm going to do something about it, and doing it. The same way Jesus' compassionate heart for the man with leprosy caused him to move toward, not away from. Everyone else's, our natural reaction would be to move away from, oh, wicked, evil, uh, um, sickness, potential death, being an outcast. He did not move away from the leper. So too, Jesus' compassion causes him to move toward us even in our sinfulness. It is God's nature to be merciful. And being fully God, Jesus extends merciful compassion to those in need. Jesus' compassion led the Son of God to come face to face with our sin, with your sin, and to die for it on the cross. Jesus did not leave us alone in our diseased condition of sin. Instead, he entered straight into it to heal us of it. God's greatest act of compassion. That's what compassion is for us, to go out and to share the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. By faith in him, Jesus takes on our guilt 
so that he might end it and we might enter into the family of God through him. That is good news. That's why we call it the good news. But the story doesn't end there. The Son of God could not be defeated by death, the penalty earned by my sin, by your sin. After substituting himself in our place and paying our debt on the cross, he rose victoriously from the grave. Uh, by the way, demonstrating who he was, that he truly was the Son of God. And now he is enthroned at the right hand of God, where he intercedes for us. This compassion continues. He intercedes for us with continued compassion, continues to save sinners who have faith in him. How will you act in faith? in light of the power and compassion of the Son of God. How will this affect the way that you think, the way that you live, the way that you speak? When Jesus healed the man of leprosy, he embodied and provided a model of what it means to have compassion. He entered directly into the man's uncleanness, the, 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 the lack of safety there, the, the danger to display his care. Touching the sick man likely would have been revolting, unsettling, and made any person unclean, ceremonially unclean. But Jesus being the fulfillment of the law and the source of all holiness, Matthew 5.17, valued compassionate action over the perception of people. This was more important to him than what people thought about him. That's hard for me. He was unafraid and unashamed to enter into the man's cleanness, or uncleanness, I should say, in order to bring him out of it. What kind of fears or prejudice might hinder you from being moved with the same compassion of Christ? I want to wrap this up. We've looked at the power and authority of Jesus. We've looked at the mission, and we've looked at the compassion. Jesus' teaching and miracles point us not only toward his power, but to both his purpose and compassion as well. All three, power, purpose, and compassion, or power, mission, and compassion, flow from his identity as the Son of God. In light of this truth, our purpose is clear. Our mission is clear. We are to continue to preach and share the good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Until you recognize that as your life mission, you will struggle the rest of your life. There is great freedom in understanding what you are created to do and then doing it. Our purpose is defined by the one who is full of power. Not only is this our mission, but we've given it to the one who has the power to, to give us success, to help us do this. He equips us to fulfill that purpose with the same power through his Holy Spirit. He gives us that power to accomplish it. We are to proclaim the gospel with the deepest depths of compassion, entering with boldness into spaces of hurt and pain that our society tells us ought to be avoided at all costs. We have a calling to tell others about salvation through Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the Son of God, the one who came to proclaim and provide salvation with compassion for them today and concern for their, their eternity. Lord, may we be bold. May we recognize the power and authority that we receive through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, to accomplish the mission, the mission of bringing the good news to the nations. Lord, may we do that compassionately. May we do that without fear of what others might think. May we do that without fear, knowing that we serve the creator of all of this, this our Savior, Lord, that we serve the mighty God, the true God, the only God. May we rest in you. May we find confidence and boldness in you. May we boldly proclaim the gospel, the good news that you have given to us. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you guys to keep in the word. Love and miss you guys. Looking forward to communicating soon about this summer and what's next. Have a great day.